Support for today's episode comes from Goalie ACV Gummies. Goalie ACV Gummies are made with vitamins B9 and B12 and other important nutrients that provide antioxidant support. They are simple and delicious. And as a Boonie Breakdown listener, you can receive 10% off your purchase by using the code Boonie Breakdown. Did you know that you can double up? So if they're already having a sale, you can use this coupon code for an additional 10% off. Again, that's Boonie Breakdown, lowercase letters. Details on how to purchase can be found in the show notes and on the booniebreakdown.com. Hey, y'all, it's your girl, Boonie, and you're listening to the Boonie Breakdown podcast, your source for all things responsible and ratchet. All right, welcome to episode 205 of the Boonie Breakdown podcast. We're back this week with a very special episode. Uh, this episode was originally recorded for the Black Heritage Art Show. Um, this is my second year being a part of that art show, and we did a special edition of the Boonie Breakdown. And I'm releasing this as an episode because I thought the conversation was amazing and got such great feedback from that platform and its attendees. And so our guests this week, both of them have actually been on the podcast before. We have Jeremy Givens, who is one of the co-hosts of the Bourbon and Boy Shorts podcast. And we have Cousin Boone, <laughs> Kier Boone, who is a contributing editor for Essendon's magazine. You've read her work on Hello Bo- Beautiful on InStyle magazine. You've read, if you frequent those sites, you've read her work at some point. We have a dope conversation about being millennials and the changing landscape of the Black family, how religious religion, money, wealth all plays a part in the decision making of having children, making your own family, how it differs from our grandparents and our parents choosing to be child free and the role of the single rich auntie. And does the uncle because we don't really it's no cool phrases for uncle besides unk, right? We talk all about that in this episode. So stick around for the conversation. We're going to hop right into my pick of the week. So I moved, right? And I'm in this space of decorating a new space. I love the new walls that I live within, trying to make it my own. I want it to feel comfortable and cozy. And so some things I'm going to pay to five for because furniture is high as fuck like everything else in the world right now. And some things I can't pay to five for. So I am saying my pick of the week. Shout out to the good folks over at Home Goods and Home Sense. Um, if you follow my personal Instagram, I had kind of shared this story where I'd wanted these little cozy little boucle ottomans from Crate and Barrel. They were $700 each. I wanted two of them. I was not paying $1,400 for some fucking ottomans when my couch from Crate and Barrel was about the same price, right? So (laughs) not happening. I go in Home Goods, find one, like a dupe of it for $129. And I gave my phone number. You got to make friends with the people there because it sucks. You, I wanted two. And so I was getting ready to take the one back and find and buy this other dupe that I found. But then the f- motherfucking manager at the home sense called me and said that he had another one in. He was I interested. He could put it on hold for me. He, I put it on hold. I went there that afternoon, purchased it. So I got two of the Ottoman dupes for $260 versus $1,400. And so shout out to the motherfuckers at Home Goods and Home Sense because those are my booze. So that's what you just got to make friends with like one person there. Give them your cell phone number. You give them a picture of like what you're looking for and they will hook you up if it's a good person. This is the second time it's happened to me, but this one, he really, really did it up for me. So shout out to Home Goods and Home Sense. <laughs> Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Come back later, please. Housekeeping. Not now. All right. Housekeeping. We want to do a little bit of feedback from our season opener with our problematic fave. I got a lot, a lot of comments. It's so funny that I think how so many of you actually love Brian, but it's just easier and cooler to be on the hate train with Brian. So that's the space that you live in. But I just got this one comment that said, I just want to know, I just want you to know that I laughed the entire way to work this morning. Brian is wild. 
I was done when he said he could get at Mama Ratchet. Congrats on the new season. Y'all came out the gate with the shits and I love it. So if you have not listened to episode 204 without Problematic Thief, go ahead back and listen to last week's episode. Guaranteed for laughs. Guaranteed for truths. Guaranteed for maybe even some fuck shit. So I don't know, but go ahead back and check it out. Also, Patreon, we have our March event. Um, We're saving the date for March 17th at 8 p.m. Um, details on the actual details of the event will be dropping over on Patreon this week first. Um, but do save the, the, save the date. If you want to join Patreon, you can head on over to patreon.com backslash the boonie breakdown. Um, we have a very variety of levels, three, six and $15. I also want to shout out my $15 gang because a bitch really got caught up and behind on some paperwork. So those of you who were owed um, merch, your merch has all been processed and shipped. So you should be see- receiving it this week. Those of you who are up for the next set of merch, um, those will all be shipped more on a timely basis. I had to wrap my head around it. But thank you for your patience. Thank you for not blowing me up. And thank you for your continued support. Also... We've been talking about, I'm putting it out here again because I have to put things out here for it in order to happen. Boonie Live is happening again. For sure, we're going to be in Baltimore this summer. I'm reaching out to a few places up in New York for this summer. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really toiled on my third city. I do not have the capacity, the reach, the resources, the monies to do more than really three cities in a year. <laughs> but I've been really tossed. And so... There is one clear front runner, but I had been running some polls over on Instagram just to get a feel of what people are thinking. And it was, I mean, some of it is helpful. So there will be a third city for Boonie Live this year. Um, It will definitely be in the South if we're going to do it in November, like we did Atlanta, which was great because it's cold up North. So to go down South in the fall, early winter, it's great. So stick around dates, details, all of those things will be dropping. Another reason to join Patreon, they will get first crack at tickets. They will get discounted tickets. And even for some cities, they may get live stream. So I'm telling you, Patreon gang gets a lot of uh, perks. Um, they'll get some more perks along with our live shows. So again, I'm excited to get back out there. COVID is over. Fuck it. Um, but we will still be safe. <laughs> but COVID is over. All right. Just stick around that. And if you enjoyed this episode, um, you can share it. You can send it to your group chat. You can post it in your Insta story. You can be sure to tag us. You can use the hashtag the Boonie Breakdown, the hashtag pod N P O D I N. It doesn't take too much. I post a lot of cool shit on Instagram. You could just hit the share button, put it in your story, send it to your group chat. It's so great. I love you, appreciate you, and it helps us grow. So that is it for me. I'm gonna shut the fuck up now and let's get ready to break it down hey everyone it's your girl boonie and i'm excited for this conversation i've talked to both of these folks we're friends we talk we text i'm excited to have uh kiera boone and jeremy givens here on the boonie breakdown it's a special edition so welcome guys hey cousin Hey, Cousin Boone. <laughs> How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing well. I can't complain. Dodge a little bit of snow today. I know. I'm still sad. I still feel like the mid, uh, where were we, the mid-Atlantic. We need yeah. a blizzard. We need a snowstorm. It's been a long time since we got a lot of snow. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, you're lucky you dodged the bullet. It's a whole blizzard outside my st- door right now. Oh. I'm jealous. It's fun. The weather it's outside is frightful. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted I wanted to talk today about well the theme of this art show is family. So my interpretation and spin on this is millennials and the changing black family. I did a little research, did some digging. We'll get to some stats, but I wanted everyone to disclose their personal feelings, statement, or current stance on parenthood. Um, I am someone who. I'm pretty, I'm 37, one. I've never have had a child. I've never been pregnant. And I'm 70 to 75% sure I want to keep it that way. (laughs) The other side of me is like, am I going to wake up at 47 and be like, fuck, I should have had a baby? Or am I going to cave? I don't get a lot of pressure. Thankfully, my mom is not somebody who's like, I want a grandbaby. She knows me very well. 
So I think she knows, like, if I have one, I have thought this completely through and it would be a nice surprise for her. But she's not the pressure. But I still feel like it's worldly pressure because people always say you're the type of person who would make a great mom, you know, on paper. You'd be a great mom. So I feel like that's where I am. Who's disclosing next? I'm 32. I don't have any children. I've never been pregnant and I don't plan on having children. And I feel more pressure from my peers than I do my family. When my family is, all, everyone in my family has kids. All the first cousins of our little cousin clique growing up all have kids. And in the beginning, I feel like people would whisper to me like, yeah, when you have a baby, when you going to that? And it wasn't <laughs> until my career got popped in that now I go to pick up a baby at a cookout and they like, put the baby down. <laughs> now they're like Mm-mm, put it back put it back keep going keep going so I'm not it's just friends people say you know offhand comments about values or what matters in your life or you don't want to look back like someone was like you don't want to be a grandparent and I was like no when I see my life I see myself you know 50 60 sitting on charity boards so that now your grand- the- your grandkids are good here's the funny thing and I know we'll get to this a little later I've always said I'd rather be a grandmother than a mother. <laughs> and I don't know how that works. <laughs> but I think it's it was so random. She's like, you don't want to be a grandma? I was like, no, I want to be the person who makes sure that your grandkids have a library to go to. And See, I'm yeah. a proud godparent. I love all my godchildren. I do skate parties when you get on a roll. And I take one of my godsons to homecoming with me every year. So he has positive okay. associations with education. There's ways to participate in the parenting process without going completely without birth a child what you want it's just not for me yeah okay jeremy and see i'm, on, I'm on a little bit on the other side i have two children i have a 13 year old actually, i actually have two 13 year olds one will be 14 next month um so I, and so i had my children i'm 36 i had my children a little bit younger senior year in college um so I, but at the same time I, if you're not ready if you don't want to you don't have children it's it's a emotional commitment. It's a financial commitment. You know, we're, we're older, so we're thinking practical now, long term. It's a financial mm-hmm. commitment. You don't think about it probably at the time when you're when you're enjoying, you know, the process of, of baking them. Um, but you, <laughs> <laughs> right? But you, you know, you, you may not think about that. Not, so, and I think also the dynamics of family, the millennial family, are changing as well. A lot of us were raised by single parents. I'm fortunate. Mm-hmm. My, my parents are divorced at a younger age, but my father, father, heavy presence in my life. Mm. So, but a lot of my friends divorced or, you know, weren't fortunate to have both parents or, or, or two parent figure something in their life. So you don't see it. So the idea of having a child young, I think often, if you don't have your child before 25, 27, you probably won't have a child or you're you probably, know what? Yeah. I feel like I was just saying this last week. Like, I feel like my window to have had a child was missed. <laughs> Because I look at people like you, Jeremy, let me, let me say that I, I look at people like you, I have another friend, um, who's this, like 35, 36, his son is in like the 10th or 11th grade. And I'm like, damn, y'all going to be 40 and like done. <laughs> <laughs> That's living because it's like, you still got the child, but now you, you still young. All right, let's go live. Right. And so I see the benefit to having children younger. And but I also was reading that millennial women are birthing children way older than our parents. And yeah. when I look at my friend group two, I can name uh, and I'm just looking at the women in my group right now. Most of us are don't have children and most of us are 35 and up. And so for me, I'm also a realist in my decision about children. I can't imagine birthing a child I guess if I got pregnant like right now I could still have a kid while I'm 37 right but most likely my first child starting to raise it at 38 years old I'm tired like I don't want to do this I don't want to have a toddler when I'm in my 40s like that part of me is like no and that's my brother and my sister sister sister-in-law uh my brother is eight years both they're they're both 38 oh they both had a child at 38 they're eight years older there so 38, they had a child and got married, got married at 37, had a child at 38. And it's interesting because she thought she wanted to. She pushed out, you know, slightly difficult pregnancy, nothing alarming, but a little more difficult. 
realized, like, yeah, we're going to see how this first one goes. And what, five years later? Yeah. <laughs> I could not imagine having multiple children at this age now, right? I don't like, think you so- missed the window, though. I think it's definitely, I know that it's definitely possible because I know people who are in their mid 40s and they're having their first child or their second child and they're making it work. So if you wanted to, you didn't wish them. I think everyone's path to parenthood and to community is different. And see, for me too, I'm also someone who is open minded enough to say, okay, if I do wake up at 47, so in 10 years, I'm like, damn, I really should have done this parent thing. I'm also open enough to say I would foster a child. Like, I don't have the desire that I have to birth a child, right? Like, I feel like there are other avenues where you can do the parenthood thing if that's really where you feel like, oh, God, let me get on the, like, let me get on the train now, right? And so I would be open to those alternative methods where I know some people are very strict in Mm-hmm. I'm birthing. I want a child that's mine, as you know, people say. So that hold I don't have. And go, going back to our friends who were my, like myself who had children at an earlier age, 23 for me, I didn't plan to have children either. So it was one thing if I was intentional and did the math and felt, OK, by 41, kids would be in college. <laughs> I can live my life. I can be on a board and making sure that colleges have schools and buildings named after them. Mm-hmm. That no, it was, you know, being irresponsible. Um, glad that it came into came into the world, but it was that it wasn't planned. I don't think at because our parents, I think more or less planned, um, and that generation more or less planned to have a child at a younger age because they were thinking about marriage mm-hmm. at that age. I didn't start thinking about marriage until closer to thirty. Um, yeah. You know, so I think you know it's a, it's a lot of different mindsets with that as well. It's funny because I was looking up some research and when you just mentioned marriage, it was some, it was statistics about comparing millennials um, and social trends to previous generations. And it was like black millennials are least likely to be married compared to our other counterparts. So it was like 48% of white millennials are married, 24% of black millennials, 42% of Hispanic millennials, and 51% of Asian millennials are married. And I'm like, wow. But then again, I look at my circle and I'm like, that's about right. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I I go to weddings. I go to one or two every couple of years. But I'll be looking at some people like, dang, y'all always at a what? That's not my, I'm not in that circle, apparently. (laughs) But I do feel like some of the decisions, as you said, that our parents and definitely our grandparents made at younger ages, we're pushing, we're pushing back, right? It's the career. Oh, you get the education. Oh, I have the time. So I just want to live, right? I don't think a lot of our parents got to even just say, I want to live, right? It was like, they went to school, they had some job, they met some man or met some woman. They had a baby, they got married, they had a house, right? And I don't feel like we're following that same straight path. It's we're making our I feel like with my friends is like 50-50. Like I have maybe three or four close girlfriends that are married. And then the rest are not married. So mm-hmm. I feel like in my inner circle, not many. If I brought if I go to like my B ring <laughs> in that level, it's a few. I know exactly that are yeah, like you got levels to your friends. Like let's not but my like best, it. my best, best friend is a millennial and she's married. So two of my best friends are married. One is a guy. He's been married a long time. So everybody knows Kenny. And then my other, one of my other best friends, she's older than me. She's like 42. And so she's married. Um, But again, she, I think she reminds me of, because I I looked at her like, damn, you starting over. She had a kid young. Her kid, like she has like a four-year-old and a son who has a full-blown career. (laughs) And I'm like, damn, you started over, but she met a man late in life and he didn't have kids and he wanted a kid. And so they got married and she gave him a baby. And I'm like, damn, that's love. Cause I don't know if I could have done it. <laughs> that, that's real love. Shout out to her for being for willing to compromise. So Jeremy, do you experience that as you're dating, right? Cause yeah. you're, you're dating and I'm sure you're dating you probably maybe mixed bags. Some women have children, some don't. Mm-hmm. 
But do you experience that? Because I haven't asked you this. One, do you want more children? And two, when you're dating, does that become a problem with women you meet who are single with no children and want children? And you're like, I don't know your answer, but I'm right, just yeah. curious. So I, 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 98% don't want any more children. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't want to, it's everyone's reason. I, I don't want to start over at this age, 36, 30, 10 and 37 this year. Um, I, I like the idea of 40, I can travel. We can have Thanksgiving anywhere in the world. Like, you know, you're old enough to get on a plane and, and, and do that. But I, I, I am experiencing women my age who still want to have children, mm-hmm. um, who may have children, who may not have children. Um, that's really the interesting thing, that a lot of women who may have an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and want another child in the context of, a, you know, a true marriage. Um, but I'm also, I, I, I'm dating, I, I'll say, I'll bring it up in the third. So it's, there's a 33% <laughs> of that. There's 33% of, of women that, like, like you, don't want any children, both of you, don't want any children, which I was surprised to find as I got older. That's became more of the sentiment that women, no, I have no children. I have no desire to have children, um, which is very interesting. But then there's a, a, another percentage, 33% of divorced women that I'm finding, our age, mm. who were married. They were married at 25, 23. They got married young, yeah. They got married young um, and are now dating again. And for whatever reason, for all of the immaturities that some of us may have had and picking a mate at, the, at younger ages, they picked the mate. They happened to marry the mate for the for not knowing who they were, and things uh, transpired. They didn't, you know, they, they weren't the right people for each other, and now they're back on the dating scene as well. Um, so I, I'm, I'm finding that a lot more common. And those women often don't have children. Okay, Kira. So as you're dating, do you find men are taken back when you say I don't want children? Uh, I'm not dating right now. Okay, but when I was. Um, yeah, and men always seem to think that they could change your mind, which was very interesting to me because in even the most common I'll get is I even once had a doctor, I wanted an IUD when I was much younger, and the doctor refused to give me an IUD mm. because I hadn't had children yet and was telling me that I would change my mind, which I found very offensive. And men yeah. always seem to think, oh, well, you know, well, if we got married, of course you would change your mind or you don't ever want to change your mind. And people like to, um, you know, TikTok has turned everyone into an armchair therapist. So <laughs> people like to diagnose your life or your early childhood experiences. Well, you just feel this way because such and such happened that, you know, it would be better once you No, my personality and my like trauma is not the exact same thing. Like I'm a person beyond experiences that I've had or witnessed. And the person that I am, I, you know, I like insecure. Tiffany blue is my favorite color and I don't want children. These are just facts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the key point you said there is people trying to change your mind. I was shocked the first time I encountered a man who was adamant about this. Like, I'm gonna put a baby in you. I'm going to do that. Like, and I'm like, no, (laughs) like, no, you're not. (laughs) And I thought it was fascinating to hear him say, like, the same thing. Well, if we get married and we progress, you're going to want to have my baby. And I'm like, I don't know that I would, actually. Um, (laughs) And so that was a hard, I don't know if it was a hit to his ego. I don't know what that was. But I felt like he was constantly saying that to me, constantly trying to get me to change my mind, which instead of wearing me down to be like, okay, I'll have your baby. It was like, okay, we can go ahead and end this because we're never going to line up on the same page here. Um, And two, medically, you know, I've been kind of dealing with some being proactive on some medical issues with family history. And it's very interesting how me saying I am going to have a hysterectomy. Like this is happening for me because it, it probably will save my life at some point. So trying to get a doctor to your point who will do that for me, cause you've never had children. You're going to regret, like you can't do like wh- what I'm going to choose me over these people that I don't even know that I want. <laughs> so even like, I don't haven't, me- they're like, well, what if you get married one day? You are making medical decisions about my body. About what ifs adhering to the beliefs and desires of a mythical husband. Like I'm not married. <laughs> it what is if, wild. And it's, you? and it's women too. Like I've had mostly w- women doctors who's, who've done this to me. Like oh, you're going to regret, but I'm like, I promise you I won't because if this 
this stays in me and I get sick, then I won't be here for this husband either. Right. And so it's like, I have to choose me. Um, and so I think I got to put me first, Lucius. You got to put me first. <laughs> TikTok has taken over my brain. I've tried to Same. like, this is a total tangent. I have tried to limit my time on the actual app because okay. you will find yourself just like, and I look up and I'm wasted 45 minutes when I could have been doing I try something to just else. stay in niches. Like I try to stay in the home decor organizing space niche. <laughs> their, their algorithm is really good. That is a total random tangent, but I do love TikTok, but it is a time drain. Unless you just want to mindlessly check out for a bit, then I wholeheartedly recommend it. But otherwise, <laughs> it is a time drain. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question to, to you, Jeremy, as our oh. resident man here. But I kind of feel like also, Kiera, you can probably relate the role of the auntie, you see auntie is a proud label, right? I'm, I'm an auntie gang. People have branded merch with auntie, single rich auntie, all this stuff, right? And it got me thinking, one, I know some people don't like that label. I have some friends who are like, don't call me that because words are powerful and I'm still going to be a mom. Like, okay, calm down. And then- You can't be both? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> um, and then I have, you know, I, it got me thinking about this because I never hear the word like uncle is not branded as well as auntie is branded. And so I'm like, it, it was auntie branded because women just women just do things differently. And we're like, yay, I'm an auntie. But does the role of the uncle exist at all? And here, do you feel like you're in the auntie gang? I'm definitely auntie gang. I'm proud to be auntie gang. I love being auntie. I love being a guy mommy. I'm pulling up to your school. I'm writing letters to administrators. <laughs> I'm an active participant. If you have a problem, call me. I check English papers and all that. And it's a fulfilling yeah, part doing? of my life. I enjoy it. I, I think unk is well-branded, though. I think in, in the community, at least in the Black community, we use unk as okay. a... As, as for an older man that you respect in the community. So maybe it's somewhere along the line, men are, are not now household. I believe they really are in the household. Um, but I, I think unk, the term unk is really used uh, in, as a term of endearment for, for an older man that you respect. I think the role of uncle is underutilized. Um, and it's for several Tell reasons. us why. Yeah. So I think I, I, I you always use my real life examples. I think because my, I'm, the, I'm the youngest of six. So my my sisters, the girls were the first to have children. So they had they they're older and they but they had children at a younger age, okay. right? So I'm closer in age age to my nieces and nephews, but still far apart that I'm I'm unk. So but in, in that in that real in those rearing years where I'm like I don't know how to change a diaper, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not I'm not 33 I'm 12. So so you, they come we come, we almost grew up as peers until okay. until we separate. So I think sometimes they see me as the cool uncle that likes to party. And part of that is, okay, cool. I, I can hang with my nieces and nephews, but I haven't taken them. I haven't inserted myself as the role of unk because we're so close in age where well, I'm, I'm realizing now looking back on some of the decisions that my, you know, that they may have made. It's like, ah, I could have stared you away from this or I'm, I, I fell in that path. Or I, I knew better. Or I could have connected you with someone in that field. Um, but they didn't necessarily know to holler at Uncle Jeremy um, in that manner, so. Gotcha. Yeah, I know. I think about it. Like, I'm cool with being an auntie. All the kids call me Auntie A. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, what it is. I love it. Oh, Kiki. I get to, that's cool. I get to uh, spoil and then take home or spoil then leave. <laughs> that is key. Um, and I do like that role because, again, you can get some of that fulfillment of having children present in your life without having the 100% responsibility of rearing them. And so I feel like it's a good compromise. <laughs> I'm also taking the hedge of because, you know, the whole thing is like, who's going to take care of you when you get older things. So I do kind of lean heavily on the twins more. So um, my nephews, like, remember Auntie A? <laughs> 
<laughs> when she get old and needs somebody to come check on or go get her groceries or something. Remember Auntie A? But then I look, I think I, about that, but I more get paranoid. Like, it's no guarantee, even when you have children, that your children are going to do right by you. Because how many aunties in the neighborhood do we see get left behind? Or how many people do we see? You don't call them until Thanksgiving. You don't call them until Christmas. Yeah. You're not even asking questions about their life. Like, only now in my 30s do I sit on the phone with my aunts and think, like, damn, I never even asked them questions about mm-hmm. who they were before they started having children. Before you were braiding my hair and frying chicken, like, what did you like? Where did you like to go? So yeah. just having children is no guarantee that they're going to appreciate you enough to take care of you. So I stress at night, like, man, I better be able to pay for this private nursing home because you never know. Right. Kiera, I was just about to say that. One of um, my grandmother's sister, she's pretty much the oldest woman in my family on my mom's side. Um, She got a little coin. <laughs> and so that has been my example. She had um, a hysterectomy around 38, 39 years old. And I believe that is why she's the oldest woman in my family because she took care of the issue and she's still here. Everyone else is dead except me and my mom. And so I look at her because she got a little coin. She's in a nice facility. I went, we went, I go visit and I'm like, this is what I need. Like how much you pay to get in here? Cause I need to start working on that. Like, and so we can go visit. She's not alone, you know, but she's been my example. Cause she's lived a very fulfilling life. Um, without children. She's never birthed children. Now her husband had, and he's deceased now, but he had children from a previous marriage before they got married. And so, but they're, you know, they're older now. They're probably in their sixties or whatever now. Um, and so, yeah, I, I look to my aunt to be like, this is the life I probably will have. Right. Realistically. Um, and I'm okay with that because she's living really well. You call her and she'd be like, all right, girl, I got to go. They're having a fashion show at two o'clock. <laughs> I like, love okay, you. Talk to you later. So yeah, she was still travels, all that stuff. So. And things can happen to you when you're young too. Anything can happen at any minute. So I'm always trying to think about what will my life be like? You know, is my insurance up to date? Are my papers up to date? Are everything, are you you know, prepared for an accident because anything can take place. So I try not to think about, even if you have a baby, so many Black women, mortality rates in maternity. Like, you have to think about that. You have to think about everything, no matter where you are in your life. You're an adult. You're responsible for yourself. And you got to get your paperwork in order to protect yourself and your loved ones, whether you're a mom or auntie or just, you know, an individual. Y'all Absolutely. keep giving the best segues. Um, I think that is another reason why us millennials are not marrying or having kids at the same rate as our parents. Money. Um, I read Black millennials are less wealthy than our baby boomer parents at the same age. Absolutely. Um, and you sit here and think, how can that be? Because... I can tell you. We went to college and we did this and we did that, right? And so when I read that statistic, I was like, I can see it. One, y'all pushed everyone to go to college and now we're sad, but y'all couldn't pay for it. So now we sat up with student loans. <laughs> the American dream, chase that American dream because that's the only way. And the American dream was a lot more expensive for us. I think also for me, my story and probably some of the reasons why I don't want children is because I was in a position where I had to take care of a lot of grown ass people for most of my 20s and early 30s. And so it's like I've already done the I've raised people. I've taken care of people. I've given financially to my own detriment, essentially. And so it's like I'm the one who was it called the the Henry's high earners, not rich yet. You know, paper, I make good money. But I was broke as fuck because I'm paying for dentures and nurses and my mother's living with me. Like I am getting financially drained taking care of my black family. (laughs) So why do I want to have kids now? People don't understand that. So they think you make a certain amount of money and you good, especially that I resent not having kids. People assume that not having kids thinks that you have this high disposable income. And they're like, well, you should be good. You don't have no kids. Or they'll come and 
people will ask you for money or ask you for help or something. And then they'll be like, well, I don't understand. Why don't you have it? You don't have kids. Like, no, but I have (laughs) bills. Right. Or I have a savings. I'm trying to prepare for my future. But I I think it's it's a a lot of different things. Well, if you look at our our disposable expenses, disposable income, cable, I'll be transparent. My cable bill, $220. Yeah, I had to pull the plug finally. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm I'm, I'm, sorry, $220. <laughs> well, I'm that's, that's, okay. <laughs> that's including home security. That's, as well. well, that's, that's, that's the security <laughs> system as well. So that's cable and security. Um, cell phone bill, 200, 200 plus dollars. I got my mom, my kids on the cell phone. Um, and then you know, so that's I'm five hundred dollars right there every on month. On two things. On two things. <laughs> <laughs> then you got the car, like so it's like everything. Got a car note, yeah. Life has changed. And so what we spend our money on has changed. Mm-hmm. When people sit here and tell me that you fucking went to college and you worked a job and paid for it. Yeah. A semester was a thousand dollars. I don't even think one credit was a thousand dollars when I was in college almost 20 years ago. So mm-hmm. it's like, you can't play this apple and oranges game. Um, it did hurt my heart because it was like white millennials have a wealth of 88,000. Hispanic millennials, 22,000, and Black millennials, 5,000. Now, we know all the systemic racism and all that shit plays a part in this, too. But it's like, damn. But that plays a big part into it. Yeah. Um, if 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 I'm thinking about my white colleagues who say when their kids go to college, it's going to be cheaper to send them to college than to their private school. So they save money by sending them to Virginia Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. That's something different, and that and their father was a PhD, whose father was a whose grandfather was a PhD, that purchased a home so wealth could transfer. I know it's, we talk about systemic, and we can't just take that up away from things because that really plays a, a part into it. When you know, when I when my white colleagues fresh out of school, their parents are paying that rent in DC, or well, their parents buy them a house. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, play, that plays a big role in it. Even um, if they don't well. having a place to land. Like I know safety people, net. black, yeah. white, right. whatever their race is. I know a lot of young professional people who have had an opportunity just to stay at home for free. Staying at home for free Makes is something difference. that is a huge difference in your long-term wealth and what you can acquire just by not having to pay rent every month Mm -hmm. and just because somebody lives at home or lives with a family member doesn't mean that they get to live there for free a lot of times people will move back and end up taking over the bills or supporting their family members (laughs) like you did and then you're in a situation where you might as well be in an apartment you might actually save money being in an apartment but you have to do right by your family to me family is not only just blood family is people who you stand by and people that stand by you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that requires a level of sacrifice that other people don't have to make no matter what their color is or what background they came from. Everybody says, oh, white parents, white families, they buy them a house and they get married. It's not always that, but they might let you and your new wife or your new husband come here and live for six months and save up the down payment for your house. Everybody doesn't have a chance to do that. That's a good point. I mean, help looks different, but it can make a big difference. Even uh, another thing, um, death, the thing nobody wants to talk about, estate planning. Um, right. When I worked in a former life, I won't say, but I used to work at a very particular place that dealt with money. Um, only most the average white inheritance from a death was 30 grand. Like it wasn't even some astronomical amount of money. But that $30,000 made such a difference, whereas it was like black families are usually burdened because there is no life insurance. There there was no proper estate planning done. And this is a mass generalization, I understand. But generally, these are just things that we don't know. We don't take care of nobody. And I even think about it when my grandmother died. Um, (laughs) It was thankfully we weren't burdened, but it was the stress of like, where is all this shit? like? Where am I, where am I looking for the papers? Like, I don't even know where they are. Um, and so these lessons that I don't think we know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. We're so overwhelmed though. And so burdened just the day to day. You can't think about that. And then you add racism (laughs) on top of the stresses of life. Like when you come home 
from work and you've been dealing with microaggressions and people asking, did, did your hair grow overnight? Can I touch it? <laughs> and like you going through all of this, when you get home, you might not want to pull out the birth certificates. And like life is just it's it can be very overwhelming. It's a lot. It is I've been a to lot. that to our to our earlier two of two of our earlier points. Also merge. We're not getting married earlier. So we're not mm-hmm. combining expenses earlier that now play into those micro microaggressions because I'm coming home to have to look for a birth certificate mm-hmm. as opposed to coming home to fellowshipping with the wife and the family. So that, that adds an le- extra level of burden. Or if I need to find a birth certificate, I have my wife to help versus yeah. I'm figuring it out on my own. Yo, that too. That, you are that, so right. That is one of the benefits. Like, <laughs> I'm like, Lord, please. So I'm getting like, out the game, I don't yo. need I no baby, Lord, Lord but send me a husband, Lord, because if we can combine <laughs> these incomes in here... <laughs> That's all I need. The two income household, I look at, and I keep throwing his name, I look at my best friend, and I be like, dang, y'all really, like, y'all living good over there. Like, y'all got a nice, comfortable house. Your wife still splurges on her sneakers and her nails, and you call me up like, ooh, what's a good bag to get her? And I'm like, ooh, get her the coach pillow tabby, you know? And I'm like, dang, y'all still splurging on each other. Y'all, y'all living a good life over there, but it's because it's two incomes over there. <laughs> no, granted, I mean, I'm not in no shambles and squalor, uh, but a second income in here. No, that that's creates, life-changing. That, that creates, uh, you know, retirement. The second income creates the retirement. That is life-changing. You're making good money and you only have one mortgage, one rent, one electricity bill, because everybody, you know, we use the same amount of lights. We just now use them together. Water bill and all of that's the same. You that can, just turned me can, on thinking about a second income. But, but, you, but, you on my insurance, but you on my cell phone plan. So my cell phone bill only goes up $20 if I put you on that. But yours Listen. comes down 100 little, Jeremy, boom. we going to do this? No. <laughs> Yo, boom. Yo, I got the podcast equipment. You only got my I'm just extra. saying, Jeremy already had his two kids. And you know, my cousin is five. Oh. I'll come, I don't go to weddings, but I'll go to y'all. <laughs> Hey, I'll hey, go to y'all with. He's a rich stepmom. Oh, let's do this. Look, this is these. What's that new hotel they opened in Baltimore? I'm gonna stay there. They got a look. Blow this at, is um, dating in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> acquisition <laughs> mergers, <laughs> right? But it it, it is an acquisition merger. Like you really that. do have to think about that because if you marry somebody that can't be a teammate and a helpmate to you, you just married a child, Ooh. and that's a lot li- a major liability. So it is mergers and acquisitions. It's not a game. It went from goats to, to houses. How what can we buy <laughs> for the 20 goats? Now Listen, I gotta bring you, you know, 20 20k in the bank or something. You know? That's true. I want to say this is one thing we have not talked about. And I I kind of know where Jeremy is on this. Kiara, I have no idea where you stand on this. Um, but I think one of the also things that one topic we just not talk about with the change in black family, and I think this kind of ties in with my longing for big mamas again. Cause I think I just miss my granny so much. And I think big mamas just play such a role in black families, but religion, right. I don't think we've talked about how religion has played into this. Um, for me, I know it's a struggle. It was a struggle um, with my grandmother because I was just inquisitive in nature. And I grew up Baptist church every Sunday, communion, Saturday church school. We didn't do Sunday school. They did it on Saturday. So Saturday church school in the morning, vacation, summer Bible school, the whole month of July. Like that was my foundation. I went to a Christian elementary school. Um, And so I know the Bible. I know the verses. I know the hymns, the spirit. I know all that stuff. The foundation is there. But as I got older, I started questioning. I started looking at things different. And so I'll never forget it. Um, In college, my grandmother paid like my rent. And once I moved off campus and all that stuff. So thankfully, I have blessing and privilege there that the money I was making was just my money. (laughs) Um, And but the, the, the thing was, I had to send her my grades. It wasn't no, you tell me she needed to see that report card from Temple. So she kept paying the rent. Cool. That's cool. So she would look and she saw one semester I took like intro to eight world religions or something. And so the eyebrow went, the good deaconess is like, and then the next semester I took Asian religions because in world religions, I really liked what they were talking about with Buddhism. So let me hop over here. 
So we had this bit. We would always go toe to toe in these discussions about religion. I'm like, Granny, you know, God is great, but there's some other stuff out there, too, you know, and which has morphed into me. I believe in God. I don't. But my relationship with religion does not look like how it looked when I was younger. I don't go to church. Um, I go when my mom asks me to, which is maybe like once or <laughs> once every couple of years. Um, I'll pray, meditate, all that stuff. But I don't have that same hold the black church growing up had on me. Them ties have been cut. And so I do think that has played a role in it. Because for me, that's even something I think about when I'm dating people. Like, right? Like, I don't mind. You want to go to church every Sunday, that's cool. But I don't need you tapping me on my shoulder, waking me up too. Because I'm probably not going to go with you. (laughs) Not every Sunday. But like, just respect the boundaries there, right? Um, the guy so, I was telling you who was trying to change my mind about kids was a big churchgoer, mm-hmm. and went with like his whole family, and was a very hyper family oriented person. Yeah, I, I think church plays never a gonna role work. in that. Yeah, I, I, I think church. I think church never. Re- I don't think church re- ever really grew with us either. As we grew, developed, they pushed education, so I got more education, so I became a worldly thinker. The church didn't think worldly either. And they didn't break out of their cocoons because I've had those same questions. Well, why why are religions so similar? I don't believe in all of them. <laughs> they, they tell me everybody say do right by your neighbor, love 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 everybody. You gonna get to the to, to the, the higher place. Um, but I, and I think church church didn't realize when we were younger we had to. As adults, I choose to even in particular religions. I don't have to believe in Jesus. I choose to believe in Jesus. Or choose to practice that. Now, if you approach me as I'm making a choice and it's not a demand, I think now we can you can have those conversations about other religions because you're not threatened by it. Because I've chosen to participate here, but doesn't mean I can't learn about you know what are they doing? What are they doing in India? What are they doing in, in, in mm-hmm. Africa? Before you know, was I you know was I even supposed to be Christian? If you're Christian, what was I doing pre-slavery? Before I came over here. <laughs> What would we doing? <laughs> it's so fascinating um, that, and that, another generalization, when you have these conversations with older Black people, that they take it as a personal attack or assault on God when, <laughs> when you say these questions or you were just exploring. Like, I just wanted to see what else was out there. Like, I still believe in God. And so I started doing my research to see. So we're saying like 72% of Black millennials believe in God, Right. I definitely believe in God. Yeah, I think most of us believe in God. But then it was like only 30% go to church every Sunday. Mm-hmm. So I don't go to church every Sunday. Now, I, I'll, I, be interested, though. I'll be interested to see now couple that with how many millennials feel philanthropic, volunteer, do charitable actions. So you have all of the layers of a church, but you just don't attend church. You're doing all of the things that church should do. Because a lot of my a lot of my peers are very philanthropic volunteer try to give back but they're not in the church either but they still believe yeah i think that's a fair assessment i mean i'm there i'll I'll do donations i volunteer my time mentor like Mm -hmm. yeah i'm not greek but the north greek leadership alliance is always getting together to do great things for the community and Mm -hmm. when i see it on instagram i pull up and just lend a hand where i can my friend, Chef Alexia Grant, has always hosted community feedings for people at North Penn Station. To me, it's very important to give back and donate your time and resources. And you're right, like that is church, that is community. That is, you know, to me, that's, I'm trying to find the right word for it, but that's how you show God that you love him and you respect him. That's faith through action and through mm-hmm. works. And that's very important to me probably more important than putting on a sundress and some espadrilles and sitting in a pew. It's just not the way that I like to show God that I love and respect him. Yeah. I I feel like those people, here's the thing. I do feel like some people with religion are playing a role. They're playing a part, right? Like you just said, I put on my dress, I go to church, I sit in a pew, I do this, but them actions don't always line up. And I even see some of that contradiction with people I know where you saying all this stuff and you judge me, 
because I am not doing the same things you're doing and your relationship with God or religion. But then I turn around and I'm like, yeah, you're not, you're not walking the walk. <laughs> like, what are you doing? But I will church? say all the millennials I know that are married are church going folk. White, black, and Latin people. I know maybe four or five couples that are married and they all go to their respective churches. And they all are very active in the church. And the being church members played a role in their wanting to establish their family or raise their family in the church. Like their churches are foundational elements of their unions. And it's nice. I respect it. If that's what you do and that's what you're into, that's fine. We can like link up after brunch and talk <laughs> about God. But I prayed on balconies in Vegas and I pray in, you know, meditation rooms at the spa and I'll pray on the bus. Like I just believe God is everywhere I go and like lives in me. Are you reading Red, Red Lip Theology? I need to. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> it's, very, it's very, very good. It was one of my most highly anticipated reading list. I saw your list on Essence. <laughs> and it's very, very good. Yeah, my sister is doing, and it's so funny because she's also doing a, a workshop during this art show, but my sister is a minister, my baby oh. sister. And um, it's very interesting watching her because I know like she has that call. She's a, she's a legit minister, but then it's still my sister. Right. And so it's like watching her still navigate life, but it's like, you a minister, you a whole minister. (laughs) That's really dope. Yeah. So um, I think watching her too has kind of, and I'll say this, I think she, for some, it may be unorthodox, like her approach to how she wants to build her own ministry. For some, maybe unorthodox, not traditional, but I think she gets it. She's making it, um, to Jeremy's point, like it's evolved to where people are. And so she's using her ministry, meeting people where we are. And so I think that's why she will be successful and I think if more churches, ministers would can make that connection and move the ministry beyond the sanctuary. Um, oh, my God, that scared me. I think she will be <laughs> the church would be more successful in reaching more people. Absolutely. I think they should keep it about God, though, because I'll tell you a story. I can't, I'm not going to say the name of the church, but you'll probably oh, I'll know say it. it. Go ahead. It's a very popular church that has multiple locations. And one time when I was dating, I was on a date and I was, no, I was having brunch. (laughs) I was having brunch at this restaurant with my date and I got up to go to the ladies room and wash my hands. And this girl comes up to me and she goes, excuse me, are you pinned by Kiara? Do you write for so-and-so magazine? And I was like, yeah. She was like, oh, I've been trying to reach out to you. We would love you to come to Redacted Church. And we'll have a section for you and all your friends and everything. So if you could just reach out to me here, we would love to have you come and worship with us. And I was like, a (laughs) section? What are you talking about? Like, am I going to get bottle girls too? It was a like a lot. It was very alarming. (laughs) (laughs) And I came back to the table to tell him, and he was like, "What?" And it was funny because I guess he, um, you know, men will sometimes neg you or try to downplay (laughs) your professional accomplishments when you're not complying to what they're doing. So he had always like referred to my job as like, Oh, you're a blogger. Like he didn't get it. And this was the first time he was like, Oh, I guess you like are a big deal. But yeah, they wanted to put a whole section in the church. And I thought that was like, I don't want to evolve that far. No, (laughs) I, I think that is also why some of these, and I call them Instagram theologians, have become successful because they make these sound bites um, that people just share. Oh yeah. And so they build this following up. But again, I just told y'all I grew up in the church. I know the scripture. And so for me, it's so funny, even though I'm not a traditionalist in any sense of the word, when it comes to religion, I'm going to need some text. So you can't just call yourself a motivational speaker. Then if you're not saying and Peter verse, whatever, whatever. And, and then you're building your message. 
that I don't want to hear it. These people just be out here spewing everything. And I think that is why I don't take to one particular, very popular Black woman who has grown a very big audience is because when I've seen you in person, there wasn't no scripture. You ain't, you ain't opened that Bible once. So it's funny. I know people are probably shocked to hear that. But if I go to church, I'm if I'm going, that's what I want. I want you to open the text. I want you to yeah, you feed me that. Up. Like build the story, build your message off of that. Just don't because I could do that too. I could put all the language and the buzzwords together and motivate someone as well. Even even with the section in church, if you think about it, my father is a lay speaker in the United Methodist, so it's like being a deacon. He can preach. He can do everything but marry. Um, if he was to speak like seven last words and we went with him as a family, they would have a, you know, a, pu- a reserve for us out of respect because it's a special guest. So we had, if we knew the mayor was coming or if we knew the governor was coming to church that Sunday for whatever reason, we were reserved. We were reserve a seat. Maybe it's out of respect as well. I just think that's different than like, we saw you on Instagram and you took a picture with 50 cent and can you please come get a section in the church like they, like, they, they I don't think a influencers selfie with for church should get me yeah. a like a section in the church i'm not a theologian <laughs> i'm not a politician i'm not an activist there's no reason why you should have a reserved section for me that's but it's giving the weird youth the, the, you resonate with the youth of the church so it'll be a big deal if you come and you're on the left side where the big deals come because the youth of the church will see you go ahead and spin it mr darren <laughs> i'm playing i'm Pun intended. I'm playing devil's advocate. Is K Street hiring? Because they could use somebody like you. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead with your spin. Go ahead with your spin. No, All no, right. No, so no. before we I think wrap church up. is important to fam to family though. Whatever church means to you, I think it's important to like have your family have a bigger goal, a shared goal. And if the shared goal is glorifying God or serving your community or something to that effect, I do think that that keeps you in focus. I can agree with that. I would say like, I think I would frame it more as like my family's value statement or something. Yeah. Right. Like what, what is that? Um, And I do, I kind of think about that, but then I don't think about it too much because I'm like, I'm also not having kids. (laughs) So, but I do think about it sometimes. Like if I did have a family or if I met someone who had kids, I would still be in a parental role like, what would that look like for me? Right. But then I'm coming into a situation that's probably already established. So, but I do think about those things about how much of religion and church do I want to be in the foundation of my family? And I know for me, it is my foundation. Now, it, what I do does not look like what I did 20 years ago, but it is who I am, right? It, it was in those formative years. And so I have fond memories about some stuff at church. I My grandmother was a church soloist, so we can commiserate over that. Yeah, she was like very adamant about me going to church. The one thing I used to love, though, this is one of my favorite memories about church, is the sick and shut in list. Oh. And so the deacons at my church would have to go serve communion to the people on the sick and shut in list. And so my grandparents, and I, they would partner with another deacon. And so we would leave church that Sunday. So I used to have fond memories of going to get granny's communion kit off the pulpit because they would put all the communion kits and they would bless them. And then the deacons would take them to the sick and sudden. So we used to go to the projects, McCullough Homes, to do <laughs> this lady's communion forever. Like as long as I would go with my grandparents, they must have served this woman communion for at least 20 years in the projects. I love that. And I, that's one of my fondest memories is, and then they had this other woman who lived in a high rise off of Utah. And so I used to love like, granny, I'm gonna go get the communion kit. And then they would let me like break the bread and like pour the stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. But like, I remember stuff like that. And so it's like, I, if you had a family, like, would you get back into church? So, but I'm, I'm also not going to be no deacon. So I don't know whose communion kit they would be doing, but. I think about that. Now, with a fa- with a, a, a wife and family from that standpoint, I definitely would want to get back in the church, but I would have to be serving. I think I'm beyond just sitting in a pew. I can do that from Zoom on a treadmill on Sunday. Like if I go back to church, I yeah, need to COVID be- COVID changed the game on right. church. 
I need to be in a video ministry. I need to be an usher again. I need to be doing something. Otherwise, it's, it just feels like a, a live show, a live performance. That's fair enough. Maybe that's why so many millennials are putting off having children. Like maybe they're finding a lot of times people talk about children in this terms of ego. So they're like, mm-hmm. your legacy, your life, what mm-hmm. are you going to leave behind? But maybe some people are finding that in service. Maybe they're finding different ways to yeah. like exercise their, uh, their legacy. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. By people, I mean me. I'm only, I can only speak for me. I don't know. <laughs> but that's to me that I feel like that's part of my legacy. Or it just makes me feel good to serve. I, you know, that is an interesting point because I am Greek. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta. And um, I have mentored dozens of young women through our, our, our two mentoring programs we have for middle school and high school girls over the last 15 years. And, huh? The Embody. That's for the boys. Um, Uh And I, some of them I stay very connected to, very close with. We are on Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. And so I was joking because when you just said legacy, um, one of them has reached out to me for a recommendation letter for potential membership. And I was like, oh, is this the closest I'm going to get to a legacy? Because this is like one of my baby babies. And I was like, oh, this is the closest I'm going to get to a legacy. So I was up last night, like, writing her recommendation letter. And I, and my mom was joking because my mom is also a Delta. And she's like, and I'm her legacy. But she was like, that is funny, Adrian. Like, I was like, yeah, I think, mom, this is the closest I'm getting to a legacy for Delta. <laughs> so That's dope, though. Yeah. Like I, when I thought about it, I'm like, damn, you're also old enough to do this because when I met you, you were nine years old. Like this is wild. So, um, so yes, I get so much fulfillment from the youth in so many aspects of my life that I don't feel like I've missed out on anything. Um, not having children, but we'll see what the, we'll see what the future holds. So before we wrap up, I do want to ask both of you. If you could make like a charge for black millennials and family life, what would you say? What would you, what would that charge be? Connect with your family, connect with your current family. I'm, I'm noticing a lot of millennials for whatever what life happens. I have 10, 20 cousins. They don't reach out to, um, have siblings. They don't reach out to, you know, often have a unique parental structure. So whoever was in the household, both men and women, mother and father, may not have a super close relationship, but reach out to your current family um, before even as you're creating your, your own family. Reach out to your current family um, and rebuild the ties and accept. You know, there'll be conversations I'm sure I'll have with my children where something I've done, a decision I've made, they don't understand. But sometimes you don't understand until you become an adult and a lot of things my parents did i now understand oh that's a tough decision and you made the best that you, you did the best you could do given the resources you had you had to make a decision i didn't like it at the time i may not like it now but it was it was no right or wrong you had to do what you had to do but so my charge would be to reach out to your current family current family members and rekindle it if it needs to or strengthen it if you can kiara my charge would be to be honest about what your family dynamics are and ask for help when you need it. Family doesn't have to look like what we were all taught it needs to look like. And everybody needs a break sometimes. So before you hit that breaking point or you go through something in your house, remember that your child has aunties and uncles, drop them off, ask for help. Don't just assume that there's no help there for you because people want to love you they want to be there for you and you don't have to do everything alone just because you saw somebody else do it alone things can be different and it doesn't make you any less of a parent yeah i love that i love that well can each of you take some time to let everyone watching where they can find you on the internet or social media or plug any projects you have going on Jeremy, you want to? Sure. So please, you can follow me at Baltimore's Obama, but I really would love for you to follow my podcast page, Bourbon and Boy Shorts. 
That's Bourbon A and D Boy Shorts podcast. Myself and my co-host uh, Kyle. Uh, we're cousins, but we talk about dating as fathers, dating as single fathers, and we have just open and honest conversation. So our premise is that our audience members are a fly on the wall to a conversation between uh, between two best friends. Um, we go live every Thursday night around eight thirty. We drop a podcast every week, so we're on iTunes or Apple Podcast, uh, Amazon. Not, is it Amazon Play and uh, Google, Spotify? So anywhere you get podcast that you'll find us there. So please check us out. Uh, we would love your support. If you're in the Baltimore area, we do a lot of events. We even host a ladies' night every Wednesday. Um, so please come out to Montego Bar and Grill. We have quarterly events. We are revamping our student sneaker party. Sneaker events have become extremely popular. We love it, so we need to tweak ours just slightly and. I think we've done it. Awesome. All right, Kiera. First, I want to say me and Booney are not real cousins. <laughs> <laughs> because I wrote about you and I wrote about an artist named Anthony Boone who makes these amazing work. And everybody was like, are y'all related? And I was like, no. <laughs> but the Boone family... At some point, is just growing it was connected growing. somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, all of us, we need to do 23 of me. <laughs> but no, that's just our joke that we're all cousins. And you can find me across social at Pin by Kiara, P-E-N-N-E-D B-Y-K-E-Y-A-I-R-A because people do cool stuff and I get to write it down. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, but I'm not responsible for anything that happened before I had common sense. And you can read all of my work at the link in my bios. Awesome. Yes. Read her work. She be writing all over the webs. Be sure to look, hop on a IG live for bourbon and boy shorts on a Thursday. And I want to thank both of you for being amazing guests for this special edition of the Booney Breakdown podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. Bye. All right. That is it for this week's episode. I want to thank our guest, Jeremy Givens and Kira Boone for their amazing insight and great conversation. I also want to thank the Black Heritage Art Show again for inviting me to be a part of their annual event. Um, also be sure to support our sponsor, Goalie Gummies. When you do that, that helps us keep the lights on over here. So again, you can use the code Booney Breakdown, all lowercase letters, for an additional 10% off your purchase over at goalie.com. All right. And if you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to listen, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or any apps that you listen to your favorites on. Don't forget to leave a review too. You might just hear your review on the next episode. Follow us on all social media. Share the episode with those you love, those you don't love, those you fucking hate. I don't make these pretty images for nothing. Okay. Have a dope ass week. Stay healthy, safe, and sane. Thank you for listening. And remember, the ratchet in me always honors the ratchet in you. Until next time.